Hey, what's up guys? I have a very special video for you today. I recorded a gameplay interview with my friend Sides for almost an hour where we deep dove into many facets of what separates beginner, average, good, and great PvP players. We also touched on some mindsets and thought patterns to illustrate what it looks like when top players are focused on getting high kill games versus getting a high KD ratio in a match or simply going for the win. Because depending on your goals, you might actually end up playing a different style. If you're not familiar with Sides, he's an insanely talented Destiny 2 player with a wealth of knowledge that is just unreal. In particular, I love talking to him because he has a very analytical mind, and in this talk, we break down some key things that I know will help you improve as a player regardless of the level that you're currently at. The gameplay you're seeing right now is from his YouTube channel. I'd really appreciate it if you'd hop over to his channel after watching this video to subscribe and leave a comment on his most recent video letting him know that you came from his collaboration project. Throughout this video, I tried to show us in-game when we're demonstrating something specific, and then the rest of the time I have clips from his YouTube channel so you can see him slaying out. He's really fun to watch. If you enjoyed this talk, let us know in the comments and rate this video with a thumbs up, and maybe we'll do a part 2 discussion. That's all for now, hope you enjoy the video. Uh, so the reason that I wanted to kind of have you on this series of talks I've been doing with friends is that there, you had two videos in particular that I thought would be really good talking points. Uh, the first one was a video you did, I think quite a while ago, where you kind of talked about like how to play for like high KD games and stuff like that versus like you know, how to get a lot of kills and you kind of riffed on that a while back. Yes. Um, the other one, which I think would be like a good segue after we kind of chat about that, was the whole idea of like what makes a good versus like a great versus an average player? Like what's the ascension from kind of being new to the game into becoming like an excellent player? So I thought that'd be a cool like thing to talk about. Yeah, we could, we could discuss that one. Sounds like a good plan. Nice. Of <laughs> execution. Awesome. Um, so the the very first thing that I wanted to chat about, whenever I'm streaming or I'm like reading YouTube comments and stuff, a lot of oh, people. YouTube comments. Oh yes, uh, a lot of people are very obsessed with like their KD ratio and stuff like that. And I usually explain when I'm streaming, like I don't personally care at all about that, just because I'm mostly there to try to get as many kills as I can, because I find that to be personally the most fun way to play like quick play or whatever. Um, and I think that like, it's the type of thing where you can play in different ways to optimize whichever outcome you want. So if your goal is to like have a, you know, five KD or whatever in your account, you can do that by playing, you know, differently than if your goal is to get, you know, 40 kills a game average or whatever. So, um, maybe we can chat about that a little bit first. Yeah, for sure. Throw a throw a little bit of a snowball here. Give me give me a starter. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So for example, um, I know in, in your gameplay you tend to go for like higher kill games. Um, from what yeah, I can I'm tell. Yeah, I'm about anyway. the KPM. Yeah, KPM, right? <laughs> so, um, if, if you are going for like max kills, there's a lot of like little decisions that go into that. Like for example, um, I just uploaded a video the other day where um, I go for like a, a snipe right off a of spawn to um, on, I forget what map it was, but you know, basically like I'm going for like a really aggressive play right off spawn. And I know that like I'm likely to die, but I might get, you know, maybe one, two, three kills off of that play. And I think it was on control as well. Versus like if I'm playing personally to like have the highest KD possible, instead I'm probably going to like stick with my team and kind of play a much more passive play style and not put myself in danger basically at all. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, I feel like every little decision that you make throughout the entire game sort of stems around that idea of like playing carefully versus playing aggressively. And you have to kind of know that, you know, whichever way you're wanting to play is fine, but ultimately that's going to like impact that quite a bit. So let's, uh, let's talk about this. Let's talk about KD versus, like, you know, frags per minute, getting kills, and being efficient as a slayer. Uh, Destiny 2 is, more now than ever, it is a very, very, very momentum-heavy game. And this is relevant based on your performance directly influencing how your abilities come off cooldown. And I was talking about this on stream earlier, actually. I just find this funny. Because uh, someone was saying, like, hey, before uh, before Beyond Light, I could, you know, get 40 to 60 kills, like, you know, with with some low consistency. But I could still pull it off. Whereas I feel like in like right now, I can't I can barely do it, if ever. And so I kinda went into this topic. I delved into it somewhat deeply. You know, I was trying not to get dunked on in comp, so I couldn't really do it too much, but uh I digress. Uh it's a <laughs> it's kind of a it's kind of a, a bit to chew off here, but well, I'll jump into it as best as I can. So 
When you're going for the high frags, you need to keep a couple different things in mind. You have an investment for every... This is just my approach, by the way. You have an investment, per se, for every engagement you take. So, let's say that, like, we're starting off here, and you're gonna snipe this lane, and I have no idea. I know that in quick play, there is almost always a player who pushes this lane. Let's say I'm on Stormcaller. I have two decisions I can make right off the bat here. I could run, like, a default that I normally do, which, if you don't know what a default is, it's just something you, you do every time you start off a map or something like that. It's just, it's muscle memory, you, because people are very habitual when they play, right? So, let's say I have a shotgun, you have a sniper, you have stompies, and I have aphidians on. You inherently have a speed boost, plus you get to jump off of the little thing there, and you can just launch yourself forward. I know that, out of any possibility, there's a good chance someone slides mid with the snipe and just claps me. I also know that, hey... If I, uh, if I can't came around, like, the left side here, I have Peeker's Avenge, and I can just throw the grenade and, you know, strong side that way. And, you know, if there's anyone here, you're now getting chained, and I can utilize that. And that's investment, and I'm potentially looking at two or more kills, up to six. Because, you know, you're gonna have people running off of the flag up here. By the time all this happens, it takes about, I think it's eight seconds, on average, for a flag to get captured off the start of a round. So... That's just an example of investment, and you need to balance that out with momentum and all that kind of stuff throughout the whole course of the match. Uh, and what I mean by balance this out and this investment and all that is, again, how much resources are you allocating to an, a single engagement? And that's not a single one-player kill. That is, an engagement could be a 1v3, a 2v6, uh, anything like that. Let's say uh, uh, me and you are here fighting one guy on B. It's going to be kind of stupid for us to, you know, throw three grenades at him. That's that's pointless when we could just, you know, both push him or, you know, both sit here and shoot him. Uh, and that's like a good example of being mindful of your of your investment. Yeah, that's and interesting. That's, that's, sorry, go ahead. Oh, well, that just reminds me that you, you threw out the word default earlier, which I come from playing a lot of Counter-Strike back in the day. And that word, to me, like kind of uh, reminds me of playing CS where every team would have a default. And I think you're totally right with the way that you talk about kind of investing your resources. Because, like, in Destiny, basically, you have your grenade, your melee, um, well, I guess, and then your super are your three, like, biggest, you know, assets you have at any given point. And each person on your team has that. So um, I guess the way that you're kind of explaining that is that you have to be deliberate about when you invest those assets into your play. Like, for example, you gave the example of um, hurting someone who's on B. Like, if you if everyone on your team throws your grenade and then that means that in that next play no one's going to have their grenade up most likely and so like you might actually be kind of outmanned in that uh, situation yeah so don't the thing about destiny and i'll get into that what i was talking about and how the games changed uh, in regards to the person who's talking to me out that on stream is uh destiny's any anyone can hit a three tap anyone can ttk you it's gunplay is not necessarily the skill centric of this game it's there but the problem is with seemingly and this is like we're getting into hypotheticals and whatnot so just a little disclaimer on that uh seemingly it, you know randomly increased flinch values uh, just watching old videos back i'm like i didn't get flinched that hard um the, you know, randomness is a huge factor, and, and abilities, as random as they may seem, definitely influence the randomness factor to a, a very controlled value. For example, things like the, the glacial shatter dive nuclear bomb that people have been doing thanks to a, a certain someone who shall not be named here. But, um, or like, you know, I fly around the corner and shade mine or someone, which is, uh, in my opinion, a horrible use of that ability, but like, I'm not even going to get into that. You know, I, I've now turned something that is, you know, a right side peak here, whereas I can just slide it, you know, maybe throw throw a, you know, a cold snap here, and I can now just push out the shoddy, because this guy's going to be in the air. He's going to be losing in terms of, a, you know, inner accuracy, because that's just how it is. And that's just like an example. You can use this to sway things. And so when we go off of that, uh, we can just, like, chain these kills together, especially if we're taking very low amounts of damage. And if we are taking low amounts, or high amounts of damage, you know, there's... Uh, like, uh, I don't even I don't even know how to put it. There's just so much you can do to mitigate that as well. I play Warlock, which definitely gives you a lot more control in regards to how you engage situations. Whereas something like a Hunter, in my experience, uh, I played Hunter for a little bit, is it's very much like in and out kind of. If you don't get quick kills, you're really not benefiting the whole thing. That's pretty much the whole Hunter's play kit is getting really fast kills on players using abilities that generally give you a very very distinct advantage in terms of the aggressive play so for example you know like the uh what's it called night stalker wombo combos the shatter dive combo we were talking about before things like that 
Uh, a really good example is if you like, uh, I don't, I don't remember what tree it is on arc staff, but if you like slid around the corner, you shoddy and then dodge, you know, there's a chance that if you do that quick enough, you might even survive what would have been a trade thanks to the damage resistance. And things like worm husk and stompies and all that uh, accentuate this play style, which is very much about like, you know, moving in aggressively and then getting out really quickly so that you're not taking as much damage. And then you can just, you know, oftentimes with different mods that or yeah, armor mods that you know, let you kind of just repeatedly do these type of things, you know, with the class ability cooldowns and all that type of stuff. And, like, that's, this is what I mean. Yeah, stuff like that. there's so, I, I think you're spot on with that, because if you, especially if you think about Hunter, like, a lot of the Hunter's kit is about, like, getting out safely. For, for example, like, the dodge is sort of, like, you know, a perfect example of that. And going back to what you talking about at the very beginning of um, our chat here, when you slide like a lane like this, a hunter can do do things like I can come in here with a sniper, slide this lane, take a shot, and then instantly dodge away to get you. Basically, it's like you you invest um, you know your ability to do that, but it's like you can basically get out of almost any situation if you have that dodge available. Whereas like a warlock, you know, having like the rift for example, you can basically like sit here and throw a rift on a corner and then have consistent healing where you're you know peeking in, peeking out, or you know something like an empowering rift to get potentially you know, more range or two taps with a 120 or whatever, you know, strategy you're using with it. But um, that's a good point. I don't think I've actually seen that many people talk about that. Well, um, each each class sort of has its own inherent strengths because of how it's designed. And, uh, you know, as a newer player, you can kind of learn to play around those uh, depend and, and c like cater your play style to um, using what's available to you. Yeah, it's, it's definitely something interesting. Titan, a lot of people think Titan kind of suffers in this department, but I would disagree heavily because that barricade can be used in diff many, many different ways. A lot of people see it as just like a brick wall, whereas you really shouldn't treat it like that, and I'll tell you why. Let's, uh, let's put myself again here in our sniper lane position. What can I realistically do here? If I peek this side, I can throw a barricade here, for example, and I could, like, be sniping towards this lane. What does this do for me, exactly? I'm still, you know, exposed to this whole sniper area, but uh, I've now given myself, a, a, like, a mobile piece of cover that prevents me from getting shotgun from this angle, which is, by the way, a very common angle. People do defaults where they'll just fly through the cubbies here and try to catch someone. If you watch my videos on this map, I do it so much. I do it so much. And it happens every single time. And that's just like a single example of Titan. I don't play Titan. Uh, Cammy's uh, really, really good at abusing the barricades, so he's definitely a guy to go for with that. But uh, as, speaking <laughs> as a Warlock main since Season 1, uh, the Rift is definitely best used in a manner where y you know you're going to be in an extended challenge, or perhaps you you're preparing for something. For example, uh, this is kind of a stupid position to put it in, but if I threw down the rift here, and I know that people are going to be capping flag because we just reset them here, and I'm like really quick, I know that I could sit here and just, you know, take pop shots, and I'm just going to sit in my rift. If they push me, then, you know, typically, like, this is a definitely more aggressive position where I'm holding them in the spawn. If I see them push me on the radar, I'm just going to pull the shoddy out, give them the 1-2 kangaroo, and then keep going, you know? This, there's not a lot that goes into it, into it in terms of complexity, but... I, I was wondering, like, how do you think about where to use rifts most effectively? Obviously, like, you know, part of it just comes from playing a lot and, you know, observing what works well. But, like, you know, when you analyze a map like this, like, how do you go about, like, figuring out where, where the most effective places to use a rift are that you get the most out of it? Okay, so I'll, I'll go into that. That's actually a decent question. Oh, I lost my train of thought there. Oh, um... The, the depth of where you put your rifts in, like, your your class ability and your utility is, it's, that's where a lot of the, the quote-unquote class skill gap comes from. Uh, I feel like, you know, that they they may feel like there's a little bit of a, I don't want to say discrepancy, but a lack of it. But, you know, where a good player puts their rift versus where, like, the best player puts their rift may be very different depending on the situation. And different people have different interpretations of situations, right? So... Ultimately, it boils down to what do you think is right in the moment. Um, so, what was your uh, your question again? Well, yeah, so that's kind of like I guess you're, you're sort of like uh, on it right there. It's basically like how do you decide, you know, what to make, how to use it? Because, like for example, and when you watch any sort of like higher level scrim gameplay or tournaments or whatever, one of the most common things you'll see high level players do is like they'll actually use their rift to three peak a lane because obviously three peaking is you know typically illegal and you can't have a sword or whatever. Um, and so like, you know, you'll see players use it like that, but then 
you know, you're kind of spending it to, to make that three peak happen. Whereas like maybe you, in that situation, you can't use it, um, you know, the healing or the empowering part of it if, if it's not a, a wise place that you used it. So I was just wondering if you have like thoughts on like how you go around a map and think about like what the most advantageous ways to use that would, that rift would be. Okay, so uh, I'll break it down. 6v6, it's going to boil down to what has happened probably in the past 60 seconds, realistically for me. If I know, because again, the radar gives us so much information, sounds give us so much information, my teammates, uh, dead symbols on the map all over the place give me so much information, uh, it usually means one of two things. Either I'm going to put down my rift and get a lot of kills, or I'm probably going to die, which is usually, usually it's the latter, but uh, continuing on from that point, let's say, uh, again, we have a situation where my team has B, we had two guys die here, I know that I just killed someone in toilet and a guy here, and that's how I'm here now. You know, I kill I killed this guy with a quick shotgun shot, uh, and then I slid out. I saw radar ping toilet. He jumped up. I gave him the three tap, and so I'm I'm like in this position, just it generally here. I know two things immediately off the bat. There are going to be people towards the portal on B and in this lane. That is a hundred percent fact. There's going to be people, if not in all three positions, uh, in one or two of those positions. So this gives me a couple alternatives. Uh, not alternatives, I guess, yeah, alternating paths. I could throw down the rift here. I could play for, like, a much more disciplined play here. Try to get the kill here if there is a guy here. Regardless, I'm probably going to be dropping the rift and using this third-person peeking for the info, and then I can immediately work and start fighting this guy. It's, you know, just kind of compressing everything into, into one swift action, uh, if that makes any sense. Or a lot of the time, if I'm going to expend a lot and I know for a fact someone's in this lane, I'm just going to throw a grenade, throw the rift, and then work from that point forward, depending on who peaks first or who actively takes the challenge. Now, in 3v3 or like a scrim setting, uh, my approach is <laughs> it's definitely a lot different in the sense where if I'm throwing down a rift, it's typically because I'm expecting we're about to duke it out. And I'm using that for information as well, because, I mean, let's face it, this game plays incredibly slow right now. Uh, it's going for the sniper pick is the play. That is the best way to play. If you have the advantage and lives or score, there's no reason to push forward. Power ammo's ban. There's no objectives. So there's no reason for me to, if I'm expecting engagement, throw down the rift. Oh, look, there's a guy here. I didn't know he was there. But, you know, there might be a guy here. But there's also a guy, you know, sitting in the hallway here. I can just, you know, take a step back from the wall so I'm not, you know, sh shoulder peeking the guy with the sniper and just fight this guy. Oh, no, I'm one shot. And Drew comes around the corner, jumps in the air, and, and glacial dives. So as soon as Drew's doing his glacial dive, I'm sliding out and fighting the sniper so that Drew doesn't get picked. And that's just an example of how I would use my rift. Like, that's a whole play breakdown. And that's obviously in a perfect scenario, not accounting for both, uh, both the team's third player. But that's an example of how I would use it to both like serve three purposes is information preparing and healing okay yeah that's really interesting i think that's a great explanation um so the other topic i, I kind of want to get into i think this is kind of a good way to maybe bridge into it is um the whole idea of like average versus good versus great players and uh maybe we could do like a part two that's like more in depth on this since it's quite a long topic that we could talk about probably for hours but um yeah what, like let's just dive into like a, a basic version and if people are into it we could do like a, a more advanced version of this um how do you think about um progressing as a player in terms of like you know someone who's new to the game maybe like they're a new light player or whatever they're just kind of getting started that uh like what are the characteristics that start to define sort of like player progression so you have like your brand new player you have your player who's like been at it for a while and it's getting you know pretty good, but maybe they're not like tournament ready or whatever. And then you have like you know the best players who literally win tournaments and they you know can basically do anything that they want to in PvP successfully because they're just so experienced. All right, so uh, to get into this, uh, looks like we're already breaking that first rule where it's like, oh, well, maybe we should make a longer video. Anyway, so let's talk about this. As a new player, uh, I'm I'm Beyond Light Billy. Uh, let's let's get a good one here. I'm Beyond Light Billy. I got my Whispering Slab. I love this bow, man. Kills those Vex really good. I got my sidearm, man. This gun looks really cool. Man, I, I've never played this map before. Oh, I'm dead. Okay, well, hey, that that wasn't that was kind of weird. Um, naturally, with the next respawn, if you died right off the bat, it's gonna be in the portal. Okay, I spawned up. Hey, let's go this way. I, I I've never played this. Oh, I'm dead again. Uh, that that's okay. I, oh, my whole my whole team's dead. Oh, my team's losing zero to seventeen. 
sorry, I had to clear my throat. Um, oh, okay, okay, I spawn here now. This is the next logical spawn in that situation. Here, let's push this way. I've never been on this side of the map. Here, I'll, oh, I'm dead. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about why this happens. Number one, Beyond Light Billy is probably going to be a pretty casual player with their uh, whispering slab in their sidearm. Not saying that that's a bad loadout by any means. I've, I've done some gameplays like this. But there's a, a fundamental thing with Destiny that Destiny plays like Destiny. Destiny doesn't play COD. Destiny doesn't play like Halo. Destiny doesn't play like Fortnite. Destiny doesn't play Apex. Destiny plays like Destiny. And there's a flow behind that. The thing about playing like Destiny is you have to be a Destiny player to understand how Destiny plays like Destiny. So let's talk about it like this. Have you ever been killed by someone who you thought to yourself, okay, that would never happen in another game? Now, I promise if you go back and look at an average play session, you probably say that a lot, and you don't realize it. Why is this? Because Destiny plays like Destiny. New players typically don't understand how Destiny plays like Destiny. Now, let's, uh, let's talk about the progression here. As you play the maps more, you learn the flow. Map flow is probably the most important thing in Destiny, in PvP, when you talk about improving as a player. Because when you understand map flow, Let's, okay, let me uh, break this down. We're getting really Inception-like here. Let's break down what makes map flow map flow. Fundamentally, map flow is going to be consisted of player spawning position, spawn weights, and just in general, the, uh, the hot spots on the map are like where all the action takes place. This map's a great example. You see a lot of action take place on the B lane, and a lot of action take place here, but oddly enough, you don't see much action in this lane, and you don't see much action in this lane. Why is that? Because they're very secluded. You don't have a spawn near here. You have this spawn, you have the portal spawns, and you have the temple spawns and the base spawns. So map flow wise, these Destiny players who play like Destiny are going to be experienced. They know where to use their grenades. They know, you know, where do people typically push as a newer player. You're not going to know these things. You're not going to, you know, know timings. And whether or not you, you agree or disagree, as you've played the game, you've developed this instinct for timing and understanding, oh, this guy's going to push here, and you you just know it. You just know it. It's it's intuition. It's just experienced player intuition. Just like if I have an advantageous e uh, angle, like let's say I'm peeking long on Dust 2 and I've got a flashbang, I know for a fact that as a terrorist player, I'm going to be peeking with an AK. I know there's probably two CTs there, maybe one. I know there's probably going to be an op. How do I know this? Because it's experienced. They know the timing, they know I'm going to be peaking, and it's going to come down to an aim duel and a utility battle. Yeah, That okay, so that so, makes a lot of sense. Basically, you're, what you're saying, just to kind of recap um, for new players who are uh, trying to like grab onto this, is basically like, a as you're progressing as a player, there's certain patterns that you'll start to recognize just from playing the game a lot. And one of the things to be paying attention to all the time is where you are spawning, where you're spawning in relation to your teammates um, and in relation to the enemies and then where the fights are most concentrated on the map so that you start to develop that map awareness of knowing like what areas are most likely to be potential threats where you need to be like you know for example i talk a lot about like crosshair you know pre-aiming and stuff like that like where to start like being ready for a fight um, because of just ten, you know, the tendencies that happen after playing you know, enough games that you start to recognize those patterns. Yes, 100%. And I actually, I'm going to chain off of that uh, once I finish this. So going back to this example, I'm peeking long. It's pretty much just a, a straight angle that comes at a, a, like a very jagged 90, 90, 90. So that means there's like a, a wall here, a wall here, and a wall here. Um, and if you don't play Counter-Strike and you're listening to this video and you think that I'm just like kind of crazy... Uh, it's a pretty much a one-hit kill sniper, and there's flashbangs and all that kind of stuff. But we're not, I'm not going to get into the logistics of that. I know just based off instinct, because I've played that engagement so much, I know there is a window of time where a person's going to peek. Now, there's a whole other thing with with lurking and like surprise peeks, and someone just stands in the doorway for like 18 seconds, and it decides just to fly out and shoot a bullet, and you die to that. And sometimes that you just can't do anything about that. It's unexpected. There's ways to mitigate that, but... And that, that kind of play works in Destiny, it's just very inefficient. Anyway, moving on, so let's talk about this uh, map hotspots and map waiting and stuff like that. As a new player, your best bet to progress is, it, you know, Destiny's not a hard game to shoot in, it's not hard to aim in. So let's say we're spawning up here. 
let's say you, you played some Counter-Strike, you like Rocket League, you play some Dark Souls, and you're a big fan of Apex, dude, you watch Snipe Down all the time, dude, he goes hard, and you want to be good at an FPS like him, and Destiny just, it captures you, you love this game, and you want, you love PvP, but you haven't dive, dove much into it, my best tip that I could say to progress as a player, if you have the guns and stuff like that, because, you know, it's not hard to farm weapons, is learn how maps flow, watch watch streams, watch games, play the game, pay attention to what happens, why you died, especially, and I say this a lot, especially for YouTube commentaries and gameplays, uh, what I was saying, as a YouTube content creator or as a streamer or anything, what I often tell people is that the, like, the almost the entirety of the match gameplay-wise is decided in the first 60 seconds. So let's talk about what that means. It, like, in, I'll explain, like, how this relates to you as a new player or maybe a, a journeyman player. If I'm going to open up the match and I open up with a five-man Stormnade and I get the five-man Arc Web or maybe I get, like, a big Glacial Dive, I've now set myself so far ahead from the rest of the match in terms of momentum that I can now start, I can one-man snowball the rest of the team. I have this momentum. Those guys are going to be like, holy shit, we just got shredded. I just clean up the last kill, you know? It, like, if you're playing that aggressively, you probably have a shot, Jan. And you can just keep going like that. Those guys are going to, like, there's, there's always a mental part of it. There's demoralization, you know, you, demotivation. And you can just keep going. And especially if you know how to manipulate spawn points, you could push, like, halfway into a spawn and walk back out and force a split spawn. Now you're in a 1v3, like two 1v3s, and your teammates got so much uh, momentum there. And if you're able to keep that momentum going, you are almost always going to have a high kill game. So now let's talk about that. How does this relate to a player who's, you know, trying to get better? They're just jumping into the game. When you have these things, you can create these plays and these openings and these windows for yourself almost every time. You just need to know when to do it. You need to realize, okay, this is vulnerable to this attack. And that's why, like, knowing the hotspots and just understanding the flow of the map as a whole. Another good one, and I'll, I'll explain here in a moment, is Javelin 4. If you know how to, like, if you win mid in that map, and we're not talking about B, we're talking about, like, middle and outside, you know that if you spawned red, they are probably spawning blue again. And you can do that, get the kills there, you know, in and out, you know, play a pick, back up, pick, back up, maybe throw down the rift, and then you can just cycle the spawns over and over and over again. Now, if, like, in, typically you're going to have those, like, two or three teammates that just, like, want running around capturing flags. Let them do their thing. They are essential to making the map flow properly. If you've noticed, when you play against a team that just stomps you over and over again, your team tends to split spawn. Like, you might spawn at B. Another guy might spawn at red on your team. You might have two teammates spawn in blue. Uh, that's because people, they're not very synchronized, and if three people are pushing the same direction, or six people are pushing the same direction, it's going to start messing around with the weighting of the map spawns a lot. And just understanding all of this information, and understanding, like, how to approach things so that you can manipulate the map flow to your advantage is the most important thing you can do for your gameplay in 66. 3v3, there's still a rule set, like, not a rule set, but, like, a like a set of gimmicks that go along with that, but it's definitely a lot more strict because you're playing against people in your own league, and it's not going to be as easy as getting a, a simple glacial dive because they're going to have the same mentality as you. Oh, I get a glacial dive. That's a free kill. You know, when you have two things clash against each other, there's going to be some resistance, and uh, how your team works against that resistance is ultimately going to decide your success in a 3v3 situation. Hey guys, it's you. No, I'm joking. So uh, we're here on Altar of Flame, and uh, we're on Altar of Flame here because I just like this map. Sorry about the change of scenery. We, uh, I talked a little too much. So, continuing off, I, I kind of discussed about how the, like, the new player and the steps they should take and what the most important step to me in my brain, in my distorted vision of Destiny 2, uh, the steps they would take in order to improve that would take them, give them the greatest mileage. Now, I want to talk about, not instead of, like, the new the new player, the uh, we'll talk about, like, the average or, like, the your getting good player level. The getting good level player, the thing is, a lot of these people, and this is the, the biggest thing, and um, out of respect, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. It's not, like, disrespectful or anything, but um, out of respect of another creator's channel. Uh, if you, I don't know, we'll, we'll get into that, so... Uh, I always uh, talk about how one-dimensional, quote, good players play, like your good trials players, your comp players, and when I say good, I'm referring to, like, the upper, the upper echelon, like, the top 10%. A lot of these guys between this 10 and, uh, 10 and 2%, they play very one-dimensionally, 
And what do I mean by one-dimensional gameplay? All right, let me eat myself off the map and I'll show you. So one-dimensional gameplay is there's not a not that there's not a lot of thought. It's that they're very committed. They don't know how to like bait things. They don't know how to like do like a partial commit. And I'm gonna show you an example here. I'm gonna show you an example here. And Patty Cakes is gonna be our test dummy. All right, so just uh, just do it. Do an engagement here. Do an engagement here with like grenades or something. I'll give you an example, right? That's like what a one-dimensional player would do, is they would just hold W with a shotgun, right? And if you're not ready for that, that can take you by surprise. But I promise you, against a really good player, that's not happening more than once. I promise. I promise. That's not happening more than once. So let's talk about what I mean by one-dimensional. One-dimensional is, again, you're, you're, you're always committed. You're always committed. You slide out, and it's like, oh, I'm out in the middle of nowhere. There's a guy here. 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 Uh, 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 and you just start shooting, you know, you don't consider your teammates, how your teammates are engaging, you don't, you know, factor your abilities into it unless your abilities are going to net you a guaranteed kill. You're thinking very short term instead of thinking very long term. Now let's talk about how someone could improve on this, and then I'm going to jump into like what the great or like the best of the best do. Uh, not saying that I'm the best of the best, but, uh, you know, I am pretty attractive. Anyway, so, <clears throat> the, um, like... Improving on this, let's say that I have heavy here. Oh, never mind. That, that community's mad at me now. So I have heavy here. I know there's a guy sniping uh, red plat because my teammate teammate A called it out because he got absolutely clapped on uh, on the big curve, the big curve clapped by the guy. Oh, he's snip sniping red plat, sniping red plat, and uh, and uh, my other teammate is like, oh, he's uh, sniping red stairs. And okay, so whatever. I'm like, all right, I got rockets. I know for a fact, if I engage this guy red plat, I'm missing this rocket. I can't snipe, I can't shoot red stairs, it's across the map. So I know in my head, two of my teammates are down, I'm in a 1v3, where's the other guy at? Oh look, there's a radar ping. I know that the, the other guy is either on this side of the map, or he's here. Because that's just where it makes sense, unless he, you know, recently did and recently respawn. As a one-dimensional player, I might be enticed to, you know, maybe throw down a barricade and try to take some pop shots here. What's the smart play here? Is it to go for the kill with the rocket? Is it to try to engage the sniper? No, my best play here is to do this. I'm going to just st step back for a moment. Freeze frame. I know where two players are. I know my two teammates are dead. I know where I'm waiting on the spawn. It's on the heavy here. It doesn't spawn here, but my point. Um, and there's a third player who's probably either on this side, on the, the red dunes, or sorry, red block side of the map. I'm just going to do this. I'm just going to go to the spawn. Just go to the spawn. I have rockets. Okay, I wait for my teammates to spawn, and we engage as a team again. Now let's let's go ahead and uh, stop there. I'm with my team now. We'll move back. We'll move forward about 15 seconds. Uh, positions have changed up a little bit. We got a pick on the guy red stairs. Teammate A slid out, hit him, cranked his 90s with a sniper shot. Cool. I have a rocket still. Uh, let's say there's still the guy red plat. Now I have three teammates here. It seems like it'd be a good idea, you know, just get the quick kill with the rockets. But why would I expend that resource? That's very one-dimensional. If I'm gonna jump out and commit. There's still another guy I'm not accounting for. He could just be sitting out there ready to clap my shit. Whereas I could just take the peak. We take the 1-1-1 one, one, one here. And then now, you know, we've got this 3-1 advantage, 2-1 advantage. Then I can take the rocket, secure that kill. And that's pretty much just the whole fight won. Again, this is, you know, granted, this is a quote-unquote on paper or like perfect case scenario. But it's things like this where a lot of people, they one-dimensionally speaking... They have this thing where they don't use their abilities for the long term, and they don't think about what happens 20 seconds from now. They think about, I have rockets, or I have machine gun, I need to get kills with this now. You, when you pull heavy, you don't have to use it. It's just things like that. Or if you, you know, you're in CQC, and I know for a fact that, if you want to come here, I'll show you an example that I see a lot of people do. A lot of people, they'll just be posted up here, or like, you know, on the, in the bend here, they'll be on the bend, like sword peeking or something. If I'm here, I don't have to actually fight this guy. I, that never has to happen. We could sit here and, and radar bait each other for the whole match. We never have to fight each other. I could easily just sit here. Someone calls out, oh, uh, plat, 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 bam, bam, bam. He's dead. I know for a fact this guy heard gunshots. I can expect him to be here. Again, that's like a, you're just doing two things at once. You're baiting you're, you know, baiting the, the peak from this guy, and you're also helping your teammate fighting a red plat there. So, again, this one-dimensional, whereas the one-dimensional player might be like, Radar! You know, like, they might just do that. 
So I'm going to move on from that point. And that's just a pretty bad example. Uh, I could probably get some good examples if I just spent a couple hours in a quick play playlist. But uh, uh, anyway, so let's talk about what a great player does or like the best of the best. The best of the best are very disciplined. This game, it, it rewards discipline a lot. Um, and what I mean by discipline oftentimes goes hand in hand with playing the game at the snail's pace. But that's, again, that's just how it is. I don't like it, but I know that if I'm playing comp, and I, I may not want to play like that, but that's the way to win. If you're playing the win, if you want that dub, if you're playing in the 10k tournament that'll never happen, that is the way to do it. And unfortunately, that a lot of that boils down to you playing off of your teammate's sniper rifle or sniper rifles. So... Let's, uh, let's take a good example here from a match that happened a little bit ago. Uh, we matched some players here. It was very slow. They had, a, I think they had a Soros, uh, the No Time to Explain, and uh, Ace of Spades, I'm pretty sure. And it was like a two Shade Banger. No, it was uh, one of each Stasis class, actually, I think. Yeah, Shade Banger, a Revenant, and a Behemoth. We had, we had the red side of the map. And it's, we're tied in comp. The lives are like 2-2. Two, two, it's 3-3. Three, three. It's coming down to the wire. Have you? We're almost at overtime at this point. That's how slow it was playing. Because it would just be sniper pick, sniper pick, sniper pick. Someone gets a body shot. And then I need to be in a position as a shotgun player to always be ready to either bait attention or be ready to clean up someone that, who's tagged up. Because in that kind of situation, it's not that I'm useless. It's that my special weapon does me literally less than my hand cannon ever would. Because why would I take such a risky play? especially against people who you're equally skilled against. Like, you might see the highlight reels where the, the hunter guy does a triple jump and a shot and then a super dodge where they spin around the mouse and then get another one. Those, again, these are the reason you see these clips on Twitter because they're not supposed to happen. And fortunately, you know, you, you never see the, the less glamorous side of things, which is three guys doing this. You know, that, right. <laughs> that's how you win. <laughs> And again, like, I, I don't feel the need to elaborate on, like, what I mean in terms of not being one-dimensional, because that seems like very one-dimensional gameplay, but a lot of the, a lot of, like, the, quote, like, skill gap, unquote, is going to come down to how you engage as a team, and then that's a whole other topic in and of itself that I, I don't even want to get into. Yeah. I've rambled too much. Well, so. well I think one, one thing that uh, could be said about the one-dimensional aspect is that a lot of players develop a particular style that they find works for them at a particular level. Like, for example, you mentioned yes. like the shotgun aping, right? Or like for me, like honestly, like for a long time, I only sniped. That was like all I was interested in doing. I really didn't develop my like close quarters, just, like shotgun in gameplay. And so, you know, that's kind of what I focused on because I, I had fun with that. And that works um, in many situations. The problem, though, is that it since it works, it's very tempting to just like kind of build that gameplay and it's what happens is as soon as you play, you know, a great player who knows how to counter your particular play style, you can feel, you know, really out of place because it's like your one trick pony play style is no longer effective. And so yeah. to me, I think that's where, you know, as, as you're become like trying to move from like a good to great player, I think that's where you really have to think about like, how do you tend to play the game? What, what, like, you know, obviously it's, everyone wants to focus on their strengths, but like, don't do it. Um, don't develop a style that is so predictable that a good player can literally figure out like your one way that you play in, in that one dimensional manner and come up with a hard counter to it where all of a sudden you feel completely helpless. Yes. So uh, the way I look at it is, you know, anyone can play Genji, but can anyone play Zarya, you know, or another example is any, you know, anyone can support, but can anyone entry frag? Can anyone throw a flashbang? Uh, I'll, I'll translate this here into destiny. Let's say that I'm just getting, dude, this guy's got host. He's giving me the pecker with the shotgun fights. I'm going to start playing a little bit slower. I need to, you know, I need to change up my play style. And there's nothing wrong with just saying like, hey, this guy's just beating me at my own game. Sometimes that's just how it is. And you got to relay that to your teammate like, hey, I, I can't, I can't win against this guy. What do we do? You know, I got to change up my strategy. And so you might, you know, alternate places with someone or, you know, say, oh, I'm going to start playing back. I'm going to change up how I'm playing guys. And this is again like not being a one-dimensional player you know you you as a player you're not hard locked to just doing the same thing over and over again that's not how things are you can approach things from various different angles let's say i'm fighting this guy here he's out aiming me every time that's okay here let's change it up glow come here 
uh, out aim this guy for me and even then it's like okay maybe he's just giving us both the, the pecker well we both slide out and shoot at him or you know we throw resources at him because once that guy is out there's a good chance that if he's beating players that are at that level very consistently he is the one carrying the team you know and if he's not then that team is just better and you lose but yeah, well, it's, it's actually something like, um, you know, a lot of players trying to get interested in trials and like have success there. And that's one thing like whenever I'm playing with friends that I'll do is I'll basically have like a default like we talked about earlier where I kind of do the same thing most rounds. However, I'll give myself like one to two chances to fail on that plan. And it's like I'm not going to keep doing the same thing if it's failing. Right. So it's like yeah, it's insanity. For, for, yeah. It's, for example, like, I don't know, let's say like Bannerfall, there's like this, you know, that sniper battle that happens frequently at the top of the map. Like I might yeah. try that once, and if you know if it if I win that fight, maybe I'll keep trying it. But it's if I lose that fight one time, I'm not trying that again against that opponent. Yeah. I'm I'm gonna Most do check. something different, right? Yeah, because it's, it's like maybe I'm a better sniper, maybe I'm a worse sniper. I'm not really sure. But the fact that I lost that fight once means to me it's worth trying a different angle. You know, maybe I go yeah. for a different pick. We you know, or maybe the whole team plays differently if if that's causing problems. But I think a lot of players like. You know they'll they'll come into that trap where it's like they find something that works and maybe that they're like a little bit better than like their opponent and it's like because they only learn to play that one way they don't really develop that ability to like try different things because you know it's like what what they're doing is working until all of a sudden it doesn't and then they haven't developed you know any other play style. Yeah. So uh, a couple things here. What I say, you might be the best at it, but there's always someone better. That's how it is. There's always someone better and. Uh, especially in the context of trials, being a multifaceted, diverse player who's very, very flexible, and uh, I'm looking for the word here, I can't remember. Uh, just being a diverse player and adaptable is the best asset you can have as a player, and especially in like the competitive environment and the competitive sandbox. Uh, you know, if, if you look at me, it's like I let Drew and usually Cammy snipe, that's who I team with. Um, but sometimes it's not working for them, and so I, I can hit the snipes, but. Uh, you know, I have the I have the the mentality to play the shotgunning a lot, like you know, a lot more efficiently. I can hit the snipes, and I hit the snipes. Um, it's just they're like they enjoy doing that, and it works for them. Obviously, Drew plays in controller, so him shotgunning isn't necessarily always the best thing, since he can't you know just hit him with the one fifty flip forty MLG, you know, whatever. But well, that's actually a really good point that you're bringing up is that. One of the strengths of being an adaptable player is that you can adapt your playstyle around the strengths of your teammates. For example, I play trials yep. often with my friend Shadow. He's also a controller player, and he's an insane sniper, but much better, like more, much more consistent sniper than I am. You know, it's like I might get picks occasionally against him, but like he's consistently hitting shots. And so, you know, if it's a situation where we only probably want one sniper in a particular scenario, I'm going to give him the sniper most of the time because, especially knowing that he's on controller. I have like the capacity to become a better shotgunner since I'm on mouse and keyboard. You know, I can basically mitigate his disadvantage of not being able to turn quickly because of the controller. And so it's like, I'm willing to give him that role, even though I also prefer sniping most of the time, just because it will make our team better if I'm able to be adaptable. Yep. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this and then I'm going to uh, quickly like wrap up what I was getting at with the whole different player categories. So let's, uh, let's get this out of the way here immediately. Uh, you may have this notion, you, this is ambiguous, open to interpretation. Uh, I might not be referring to you. I might, I might be referring to you. There is no one special weapon that is inherently more skillful. Anyone can hit a headshot with a sniper. Anyone can one-shot with the shoddy. Shotguns RNG. Snipers also feels like RNG half of the time. If you feel like, oh, I don't want a shotgun, that doesn't take skill. Go put on a shotgun and play against good players who know how to shotgun good. I promise you'll understand the skill gap. The skill gap's not in, it's not in the application of the weapon, it's, you know, how you work around it, I guess, is how I would put it. Again, with snipers, you know, anyone can hit a headshot, but can you hit a sliding headshot on a guy who's already pre-aiming you? Or, you know, can you, do you know how to, like, you know, send your teammate out to the right and then you peek to the left or whatever, you know? And there's a lot of different ways to look at it. Uh, and I find that most sniper play oddly wraps around more of the macro primary play than actually using a sniper most of the time, but... That's like a whole other topic again. Like we're getting into <laughs> so that's a rabbit territory. hole. Yeah. Um, so just to wrap up or like kind of summarize what I mean by like the average and good and great and the best. 
like an average player, they're, they're going to be pretty casual, you know, they're just going to run around drinking their, you know, Budweiser after work, shooting their, uh, shooting their aliens in PvE, decide to shoot some other guys in PvP because it's funny, they like throwing hammers at you, ha, uh, you know, nothing too, I wouldn't say that's average, but that's like definitely more casual, the average players probably, they probably put some hours into PvP, I think that the average skill gap in Crucible has increased uh, dramatically across the past three years, um, and I think that there's a lot of different people to blame for that. Uh, Nomad, you, <laughs> Cammy, Drew. Anyway, the uh, like the average players, they're definitely going to be a little bit more adept in terms of like how they approach maps. They they know the angles, they know the spawns, they know the hot spots. They may not know necessarily how to exploit every situation or like how to exploit those uh, hot spots, but they they know what they're doing. They they can put in shots. They can get TTKs. Now let's talk about the good players. Again, uh, this is where you start running into the, the metric where this person knows how to play with the team and against teams. And that's why you start seeing people around this level getting, like, really good at pub stomping. Like, these guys can, you know, always drop 30s, always 40s. They're always positive in quick play. Um, and a lot of this boils down to their weapon and loadout they're using, which is usually the cheesiest thing in the planet. But, like, that's, a, again, I digress on that. What you use is what you use, right? Like... Some people play differently. I like to play for the diversity. Some people like to play for the dub. Awesome. Woohoo! Uh, you know, they play one dimensionally, but they, they, you're starting to get to the level where you know how to work with your team. Although you kind of, you might tunnel vision. There's probably a lot of tunnel visioning at this point where it's like this guy sees a radar thing and they just want to just go straight at it and give it a hug. Or, you know, they just want to, you know, sit there in the scope like, ah, oh, he peaked once. I'm going to sit here. And then they get shotgun from behind. Um,. And then when we start getting into the great or like the upper level, you know, the 2%, the 1%, people are, are getting to the point where they can play around the team. They can coordinate with their team really well. They have team defaults. You, you know, they're, they've they mastered their subclass. They've mastered their exotic. They they have their hand cannon or their pulse or their shotgun and snipe or fusion that they, they run with it and they hit the shots. They know how to work with the team. They know how to commit and uncommit and bait and reverse bait and do all these kind of things because they've put in the hours and they've practiced. It's the nat next natural progression in terms of experience. And this is what I'm going to say. It's pretty much all experience from the good player point onward. But you can definitely progress this a lot faster by, you know, being critical with yourself. Like, all right, what did I do wrong this match? This guy killed me every time. Okay, I need to stop peeking table at Anomaly, you know? I actually think that's one of the biggest things that most players... Uh, who want to get better don't utilize is recording their own gameplay and looking at it critically to you know decide where they could improve i think it's yep. if you study any professional like esport level game it's like a, a mandatory thing that every you know team does is they yeah. re, you know review not only their own gameplay but opponents and try to like learn what they could do better and i think that's something that that you know probably especially the the casual player to like the average player but even like i would say the good and great players a lot of them probably um could do it more i definitely could do more of that myself uh you know it's i'm that's coming from someone who does a decent amount of it already so i yeah. think it's a very valuable tool so i'm gonna get this out of the way and just treat this as a sign uh, if you're listening to this treat this as a sign and you want to improve so you play trials with your friends and you guys got beat up so bad by a team in trials. You just absolutely smoked by this team. You just don't know what went, went, went wrong. Like, how, how are we losing these kills? Or maybe you're playing comp or survival or whatever it's called now. And you're just getting beat up. Record that match. Watch it back with your friends. I promise you'll see things that you just were oblivious to. Oblivious to. And it's not supposed to be like, oh, you fucked up. It's supposed to be like, hey... um, you know, we, we messed up as a team, or, oh, dude, I like, you know, I shouldn't have pushed there, I should have pushed here, or I should have been looking here, or I should have listened to your call, and I didn't hear it, or I didn't process it. I promise, I promise, I promise, you will take yourself from, like, a 6 to an 8 just doing that once a week for a month. Mm -hmm. Totally um, agree. I think that's one of the best things people could do to improve. Yep. And so I'll use this, actually, to kind of shuffle myself onto the... Uh, like the best player area. So let's talk about what the best players will do. They're pretty much just masters of all, right? Like that's that's a given. But the thing is, the best players, they're very, very, very consistent. And that's through putting in the hours and running these routines over and over and over again. Watching the demos. They've got the experience. They know. They've been in every situation before. And it's even something that I struggle with sometimes with like baiting out the, the glacial, the glacial shattered, I think, cause you know, stasis is a whole new thing. 
Um, it, you know, there's there's a lot there's a lot behind it. It's a depthful game, but it ultimately does have a lot of cheese. And I think the best player is the player who really knows how to mitigate and work around that cheese uh, in the most efficient manner possible while working with their team. Where a lot of the time it boils down to just holding your abilities and waiting for other people to use them. And I know this kind of doesn't this doesn't explain a whole lot in regards to this, but it, it's it's such a hard it's hard to quantify like what makes the best player the best. But if if like you you watch it like you watch like one of the quote unquote best players whatever your de you know, definition may be, you'll notice that there's something different between them and the rest of the population. There's a reason these guys are always able to get you know forty, fifty, sixty in in your quick play or you know. They're always able to like kind of just frag out in survival or trials. There's a reason, and it's a lot of it is just mastery and understanding of the game, and studying the game, studying any FPS or any competitive game is the single most important thing to uh, success and improvement. And again, this ties back to what I was talking about with like map flow and understanding the map and defaults and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things you mentioned too is consistency, and I feel like that's actually one of the things that leads to the most consistency is seeing enough situations play out over and over again that you start to understand what to expect. Like you talked about, like the Drewski Dunk, uh, you know, stasis combo. Like if you've seen you know enough people do that to you, you're you're gonna start like having that sixth sense of like understanding it's about to happen and then playing differently because of that right whereas like the, yep. the the player who's like maybe newer to casual they might fall into that trap over and over again because they're just they haven't seen it enough times to like anticipate it yeah i would 100 uh, percent agree with that they're, they're just they're not going to be adept enough to just be able to read these plays mm -hmm. and also i think a, a big part of it too is is playing against um other great players all the time so that you kind of see like the gamut of every every exploitable thing that can be used against you you know if, you, if you're playing against like you know tournament level players who have just played you know thousands of hours of like high level pvp there's very few things that they haven't seen right like they just they've seen pretty much everything that you can imagine thrown at them and they know they generally speaking have like a plan to mitigate that whereas that's yes. just it's just something that takes experience but but i think it's, it's, it's not just experience it's like mindful experience where you're paying attention for stuff like that you know because it's yep. like you know it's one thing to like experience something many times but if you're you know like we said going back and watching the reviews and figuring out where things went wrong you're going to be more conscious of that next time you come across it because you've actually paid attention to it yeah you're going to be able to read these situations easier and be like uh, this is familiar again that that natural instinct is going to kick in and you're like i need to leave now and then, you know, sure enough, you know, Clay shall die right in front of you where you would have died. Exactly. So I failed to elaborate a little bit on how Stasis changed the Crucible when I was talking about uh, the player who was talking to me about how they were able to drop like 40s before or, or like, you know, with some decent consistency, but they can't do it much anymore. Stasis changed the Crucible in that manner where your gunplay in the days of you being a beast with a special weapon, are there's, those days are over. Like, that's just how it is. Um... And it's a lot more about passively, not passively, but like decisively using your abilities to defeat other people or prevent them from cheesing you. Now, you might see these clips where people, on, you know, on Twitter or YouTube or whatever, they're like, lol, stasis is broken. But and it, a lot of it is them, you know, spamming like a, a freeze and then another freeze and another freeze. What you need to understand is Destiny plays much more like an MMO than it ever has before. You have ability cooldowns. Your abilities are on cooldown. You're going to spend the next 48 seconds getting literally railed by other stasis abilities because you have nothing to counter with. That's how it is. So my uh, my approach is that stasis has changed the Crucible into less of a like special weapon spam fest into more of a take your time with your engagements. You can still be really fast, but you need to be a lot better than you were before. Nice. Uh, so I feel like that's a pretty good place to wrap this up. Do you have any final thoughts uh, on this topic before we uh, um, wrap up? Final thoughts. You don't have to have any, but I just didn't want to cut you off if you have any last words of wisdom to share. Um, play in practice. Don't Don't play the game because you feel like you have to. Play the game because you want to. Your, your best enjoyment, or sorry, the best progression is going to come from actual enjoyment, genuine enjoyment, not because you want the Twitter cloud or whatever. Um, I'm trying to think what else here. 
that's that's pretty much it. Just take it at your own paces. Again, the, the game, it's not MLG. It's not competitive. There's no objective game modes. Your uh, like approach to playing it objectively, or sorry, competitively, is objectively 100% because you enjoy it. If you don't enjoy it, go do something else. That's all I have to say, you know? It's a... Smart words. Yeah, that, that's it. Nice. Uh, so, okay, where can people find you online if they would like to watch more of your videos and learn more from you? That's a great question. Um, I don't know my link. Oh, yeah, I do. Uh, YouTube. I like got YouTube. I just type in sides, S-I-D-E-Z-Z, or youtube.com slash sides. I have the custom URL. Uh, Twitter at uh, S-Sides. It's just sides with an S in front, two S's. Uh, Twitch, it's sides with an underscore pretty creative here if you couldn't tell <laughs> i'll throw all um, this up on screen too so people can uh see it yeah. easily uh i don't have stadia i i don't have that <laughs> me neither um uh, that's I, I don't i don't know if i do anything else socially i just kind of sit yeah. and make videos and that's all good sweet <laughs> that's it, man. nice well thanks for doing this with me this will be really valuable i think people are going to learn a lot from this uh, discussion yeah, no problem. I'll, I'll the invoice. It's it's about six hundred thousand, but I, we can good. make a payment plan. I'll have to get a, a yeah, <laughs> I'll have to get a donation button going. <laughs> it, was, it was a lot of fun. I appreciate you uh, inviting me to uh, talk too much about things and <laughs> struggle to wrap up my points. But hey, you only get better. With I got a lot of good right? stuff to talk about. <laughs> awesome. Yep. Cool. Well, thanks so much, Jay. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Wow, that was such a good discussion. I wanted to again thank Sides for taking the time to do this collaboration with me. Please stop by his channel to subscribe and let him know if you got something cool out of this talk. Let me know in the comments who'd you like to see me interview next for the series. I have a lot of cool ones coming down the pipeline for you and I've really enjoyed making these kinds of videos. If you're new to my channel, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next video. Also, consider joining our community Discord server. We have over 6,000 Destiny players who love talking about the game and helping each other improve. The link to join is discord.gg slash pattycakes. That's all for now. Catch you guys next time.